campaign. Throughout the campaign, it was a bit like being in limbo. I was still a cabinet minister, but your civil servants treated you as if you were, I don't know, um, um, I don't know, um, suspended. So, I mean, in that sense, Harold very wisely allowed the freedom necessary for the government to survive. He saw it was a way round a difficulty when he had a divided cabinet and didn't want to sack off of them. After weeks of campaigning across the country on separate platforms, Harold Wilson agreed that for the first time, the two leading cabinet ministers could even confront each other on television. Wilson had calculated that by showing flexibility over the normal cabinet rules, Europe needn't break up his cabinet. Roy said a moment ago, in a sense, that we must give up some of our political liberty in order to enjoy no, no. Some this... some of our political sovereignty, which well, is a quite uh, different matter. Sovereignty Pool our a... sovereignty. Well, no giving... question of giving up liberty at all. And well, please, please give up the liberty... Don't put words like that. No, but give up the liberty to decide our policy through... It was a civilised discussion, in the sense there was no hostility, putting quite contrary views, and then afterwards... Uh, returning to, to the same cabinet. And I think that was a very good example of what I would call the maturity of politics. After Thursday, we're assured by the Prime Minister that their freedom to argue, at any rate in public, comes to an end. Gentlemen, thank you both very much again, and good night. John Major didn't have Harold Wilson's success in holding together a cabinet that was deeply divided over Europe. He came under bitter attack from the Eurosceptic Chancellor he had sacked. And when it was suggested that Major should fire a further three Eurosceptic ministers, he revealed his frustrations in remarks that he thought were off the record. But where do you think most of this poison has come from? It's come from the dispossessed and the nether-possessed. You and I can both think of ex-ministers are going around causing all sorts of trouble. We want three more of the bastards out there. The... John Major was treated extremely badly by the Eurosceptics in the party. Europe became the obsessive issue of that one element of the Conservative Party, and uh, they they behaved disgracefully. There's no dis no question about it. There was nothing he could do. They were they were out there leaking. They were conspiring against him, and uh, th that that got to him. It was extremely um, uh, unpleasant for him. This was this was his own cabinet colleagues. Oh yes, oh, yes. I'm no longer prepared to tolerate the present situation. In short, it is time to put up or shut up. In the number 10 garden, Major had suddenly challenged his cabinet opponents to stand against him for the Tory leadership. The arch Eurosceptic John Redwood, surrounded by a colourful band of supporters, took up Major's challenge. He resigned from the cabinet and stood for the leadership on an uncompromising Eurosceptic ticket. Should be doing. And all the time I was Prime Minister, I would not bring proposals forward to abolish the pound. It was a dramatic moment. Here is the Prime Minister who resigns and tells people to put up or shut up. But when he was asked, he thought that no member of his cabinet would stand against him. Hmm, well, and he misjudged it, didn't he? Hmm. What's happened to the drinks? Although John Major did manage to fend off Redwood's challenge, there was to be no lasting victory. Despite valiant battles in his own cabinet, the divisions over Europe helped bring about Major's downfall. When Tony Blair came to power, he inherited the inflammatory issue of whether to abolish the pound and join the euro. Beneath the smiles at the very first meeting of the cabinet, both Blair and Gordon Brown knew that the government would at some stage have to take the Euro decision. But so far, the cabinet has had no detailed discussions about whether or not to join. Instead, ministers have agreed to wait and see whether Gordon Brown's criteria for membership are met. At the end of the day, uh, you're making a decision about the criteria as to whether you should or you shouldn't. And if you had a big argument about are we going in tomorrow or not tomorrow, you might have more controversy. Now, you and I know there were a lot of differences around that table, some of them quite strongly held. But individuals made, made the conclusion that this is where we think it best to stand while we get on trying to deliver some of the other things. coffee time in the anteroom for Blair's latest cabinet. Don't mention the euro has remained the watchword. 
but the cabinet will have to discuss the euro question before long. And once again, the decision will be crucially dependent on the outcome of the often stormy battles between the prime minister and his restlessly ambitious chancellor. Their relationship is at the heart of the Blair system of cabinet government. But the body language between Blair and Brown when they met in the cabinet room in July scarcely suggested that the two were in closest harmony. Tony has always said you can't have a division between your chancellor and, and the prime minister, and he's absolutely right at that. And of course, one of the problems in politics is you may have two people, but they all have their people around them, and um, sometimes you get quotes given from the side of the mouth and no, nobody actually quoted, which has led to certain tensions from time to time. I've been involved in some of those scrapes myself, so I understand them. When you have two people that aren't working together, and that's the Prime Minister and the Chancellor, it doesn't lead to positive, easy decision-making. You know there's a battle going on, and people support or people go to one side or the other, and I think that is just cr crippling for a government. And is that what was happening with, with uh, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair? Well, they were not happy. The Blair-Brown nexus is central to the way this cabinet is run. And in past governments, the relationship between the Chancellor and the Prime Minister has had a troubled history. It always goes wrong. It always goes wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Why does it always go wrong? Well, because the economy in the end always goes wrong. And the Prime Minister is, is, is one removed from the management of the economy and the Chancellor is presiding over an economy that he doesn't actually control. Um, and, and so it goes wrong. I mean, it's, it's the natural sort of way of politics. But if, if they kind of fall out publicly, then, then the, the government, the Prime Minister and the Cabinet is in trouble if, if, yes, if they don't uh, present a united yeah, front. But even if they don't fall out publicly, their supporters will fall out for them publicly. But the greatest potential destabiliser of the cabinet system can come at times of military conflict. An object lesson is the fate nearly 50 years ago of the debonair Tory Prime Minister, Sir Anthony Eden. Eden became obsessed by the Egyptian president, Colonel Nasser. Nasser was an Arab nationalist who wanted to export violent revolution across the Middle East and destroy Western imperialism. When he seized back the Suez Canal from British and French control, Eden determined to take military action against Nasser. We all know this is how fascist governments behave. And we all remember only too well what the cost can be in giving in to fascism. Sir Anthony Eden demonised Colonel Nasser. He felt Nasser had betrayed him. Eden was driven by a personal loathing of Colonel Nasser in 1956, which overrode everything else. And it's very hard to curb a prime minister who's got religion on something. Very, very hard indeed. Without telling his cabinet, Anton Eden forged a military plot with the French and the Israelis. In strictest secrecy, top men from the three governments drove to a house outside Paris to fix a complex deal to seize back the canal by military force. British troops landed at Suez. Eden's cabinet was still largely in the dark. In London, there were bitter protests. And under pressure from the Americans, Eden was forced humiliatingly to withdraw from Suez. Eden broke all the rules of a prime minister in warlike circumstances. He didn't bring his full cabinet into proper confidence, so they knew more than they ever let on about the secret agreements with the French and the Israelis and so on. He didn't listen to his professional military advisers because they warned him and told him things he didn't want to hear. He allowed it to not just get personal, but remain personal. I think the Anthony Eden experience shows you two things. One is losing a war is disastrous for a political career. It was curtains for him. And secondly, I think a massive deception practiced against all your political colleagues is impossible to sustain. And now, can I just say, thank you very much for all your kindness to me, all of you, during my period of office. I wish my successor all good fortune. 
and Godspeed to you all. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Eden resigned, a cautionary tale of a prime minister who tried to run a war behind the back of his own cabinet. 25 years later, the Argentines invaded the Falklands. The surrender of the token force of British Marines symbolized national humiliation for the Prime Minister. I can only tell you that from the day that I heard that they might invade, to the night when we heard that the white flags were flying over Port Stanley, I lived at an intensity, at a concentration that I have never experienced before or since. Not known for her collective approach, Mrs Thatcher now felt the need of her cabinet around her. At night, she held a second emergency cabinet meeting in 12 hours. It was a very sombre cabinet. I think everybody appreciated that uh, if we had a, added a military disaster to a diplomatic failure, you, you know, that would be the end of the Thatcher government. That wasn't spoken, but it was in everybody's mind. And it was a very risky enterprise. I mean, eight and a half thousand miles away from home, four and a half thousand miles away from the nearest land base, Ascension. It was a huge undertaking. <laughs> The biggest naval task force since the Second World War was hastily assembled over a weekend and it set off for the Falklands. But Mrs Thatcher, who had no military experience, faced the problem of how to run a war if diplomatic efforts to reach a peaceful solution failed. She turned for advice to one of her predecessors. Harold Macmillan had served under Eden during Suez and in Winston Churchill's war cabinet. He said that it was a great mistake to have the Chancellor of the Exchequer in a war cabinet because then people started to fuss about the cost of it all and that took your eye off the ball, the goal of winning. When you're putting soldiers, sailors, airmen's lives at risk, you can't be fussing about the precise details of how much each bullet costs or whether you can afford a replacement tank or something. You've taken the decision to put your servicemen's lives on the line and you have to do whatever's necessary to make sure they're properly supported. The members of her war cabinet with the Deputy Prime Minister, Willie Whitelaw, who was later to admit he had visions of Suez during the Falklands. Francis Pym, the Foreign Secretary, was seen by Mrs Thatcher as insufficiently resolute. But the party chairman, Cecil Parkinson, was a Thatcher loyalist. And key members were the Defence Secretary, John Knott, and the Chief of the Defence Staff, Admiral Sir Terry Lewin. She was a relatively new Prime Minister still, with relatively little experience of military affairs and therefore needed the expert advice that came from the Chief of the Defence Staff and from the Ministry of Defence um, for the decisions which needed to be taken. As our troops abandoned stricken ships and made landfall in the Falklands, their progress was agonisingly monitored by the War Cabinet in London. She ran a twin track cabinet system then. They would have, she would have an extra cabinet meeting, usually on the Tuesday morning, to brief them with her special war cabinet, a subgroup of her defence and overseas policy committee, proper cabinet committee, doing most of the executive operational stuff. She took the classic mould model of how to do it, and she did it very well. And she put on one side for the duration of that conflict her command and control impulses and played the collective leader. Very sensible, very important. I have just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. The victory parade in the city. The Falklands had transformed Mrs Thatcher's political standing. She'd started the war as the most unpopular prime minister in British political history. If you look at Mrs Thatcher after the Falklands compared to Mrs Thatcher before, it's a different personality. It's a much more confident personality, much more aware of the powers of leadership and that very strong brand dominance, if you like, of Thatcherism, uh, the identification of the government with the Prime Minister. It is a feature. I think a war cabinet plays a role in creating